And we're joined by General Manager Mike Mayock from Mobile, Alabama at the Senior Bowl. And Mike, first off, how are how is life in Alabama right now? It's pretty good. I mean, there's a new setup this year, Eddie. That's really cool. We're at the University of South Alabama. Uh, it's a brand new stadium on campus. Uh, we've got a box overlooking the 50 yard line. So I've got, you're only allowed 10 representatives per team instead. So we don't have even have any coaches here. It's 10 scouts. Uh, we get tested every day. Uh, the access is different, but it's kind of cool because we have four hours of interviews every night. So from a, from 7 PM to 11 15, we've got a series of 32 interviews and it's, it's been pretty cool. And it's been really well run by Jim Nagy who runs the senior bowl. And, um, even during a COVID situation like right now, uh, we're getting all the information we need. You know, and obviously this off season is going to be so much different compared to off seasons we've had in the past, Mike. And how valuable is that time in Mobile for you and the staff to get a to get a chance to meet these guys, to get a chance to see them in pads and doing what they do best? It's critical because, you know, we got a taste of it last year with all the virtual meetings, no pro days, all of that kind of stuff. I think we learned some lessons. We were all hoping we were going to have a normal off season, and, and we obviously don't. So this is going to be our best opportunity by far to get to know over 100 guys, to have an opportunity to interview every single one, to watch three days of practice. The practices prioritize one-on-one drills. Uh, so we're working from about 5.36 in the morning to 11.15 at night. And this is probably going to be the best week of information gathering in the off season because uh, the combine is not going to be the same. Uh, we are going to have pro days, but the amount of contact at pro days with the individuals, even with coaches at the school, is severely restricted. So it's going to be another off season with virtual meetings. And uh, that's why the, the value of the senior bowl, I think, is is maybe more value, valuable than it's ever been. You talk about how important this week is for you and the staff and the organization. And and I wonder from an evaluation standpoint, Mike, what is the position that you need to see these guys in person? You know, like it's it, the tape is great. You can learn a lot about a player from the tape. But what is the position where you're like, I need to see him in pads on the field going through drills? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I in, in the past, I always would have said the easy answer is quarterback. And I still believe that. OK, you can evaluate quarterbacks all day long. But until you stand on the field with them and watch the ball come out of their hand, it's a different conversation. You, you can measure accuracy. How far did it get thrown? Did he put air under it? All that stuff on tape. But you got to feel it. You got to feel the ball coming out of his hands. What kind of velocity? Just you, you got to feel the quarterback, his drop, his ability to command a huddle. You know, there are a lot of these college kids that have never even been in a huddle. So it, it's being in person for quarterback is critical. Now, that's my generic answer. I, I think in real life, it's critical to see all these guys. Just, a, for example, a wide receiver. Again, guy runs 4-4. Great. But does he play the 4-4? How does he come out of his breaks? Do you feel him coming out of his breaks? Or does he have to kind of measure himself coming out? Uh, the one-on-one drills here are what really the senior bowl's always been about. And the opportunity to watch the offensive linemen and the defensive linemen one-on-one is, is really, I'll go home and watch that film to remind myself, but in person, again, it makes a difference. You know, and really, I think the hope for, for you and the staff, for fans of this team, for this organization as a, whole, as a whole, is like you said, you get a lot of good information, you take advantage of the situation, hopefully 2021 is even bigger and brighter for the silver and black. But going back to 2020 for a sec, Mike. How do you classify that year? Because on one end, you see an increase in the win column, but on the other end, it, it almost feels kind of like a season that uh, of what could have, should have, would have been as well. Well, no excuses. I, I would characterize it as frustrating and disappointing. You know, we were, we were six and three, and we controlled our, our own playoff lives, and we didn't take care of business. Uh, so the year before, we were six and four. You know, so um, I think the difference this year if I had to say, where did you make a jump? Uh, you know, we beat some really good football teams this year. We beat Kansas City. We beat Cleveland. We beat New Orleans. But the problem is we didn't do it consistently enough, especially at the end of the season. So uh, did we get a little bit better? Yeah. I think we, we were a top 10 offense. Uh, Any way you want to ca categorize that, including points per game. Uh, liked what we did offensively, but we got to get way, way better on defense. 
And I think that, you know, if you're a fan, and, and Mike, you know, you don't, you don't live in a vacuum. You see the same things that we do, that if you're a fan of this team, you go into this offseason saying, how are we going to fix the defense? Obviously, Gus Bradley is going to be a, a key part of that. But do you, when you look at the defense kind of as a whole, looking back to last year, is it as far away as a lot of folks out there seem to think it is? Because when I take a look at it, I, the cupboard isn't bare. So how do you kind of, I guess, a, approach rebuilding this defense over the next couple months? Yeah, it's, it's another good question. I mean, um, the way we look at it, or at least the way I look at it, is that last year we did not have a dynamic playmaker at any level. Okay, and that's hard when you go into a game every Sunday and they, they don't have to specifically game plan for any one player. Okay, when you take a step back, do you go, is there anybody in the building that could be a dynamic playmaker? And I think we have a few guys. You know, Max Crosby played through some injuries last year that a lot of people wouldn't. Um, I think Cleland Farrell is going to continue to develop. On the back end, we've got some talent, but we, and again, no excuses, but we had so much COVID, so much injury. So, you know, in the last two years, we put a lot of draft capital on the back end, and it's time for them to start playing. We got two first round picks, we got a second round pick, we have two fourth round picks. And at the end of the day, they need to be a lot more consistent. And again, COVID year, a lot of injuries. I get it, but we've got to demand more from them next year. You know, and you, we've we've heard that a bunch throughout the throughout the season, really off season. Wells, you know, we're not here to make excuses. And I look at it as it it's just not it's not excuses. It's the reality of the situation. And speaking of that reality, Mike, this rookie class kind of in totality, it felt like it took a while for them to kind of get their bearing, to get their sea legs under them, because of the weirdness of the off season last year, because of just the incredible circumstances we all lived with we all lived through this year is it kind of harder to evaluate what they did as a collective last year uh not really i was disappointed in the productivity of our rookies i'll be the first one to, to admit that uh you can make excuses you can have a conversation why um you know henry Ruggs, i think is who he is we i don't i'm not disappointed in henry i think henry's got to get better you know and we knew how fast he is but he's got to get stronger and he's got to get in and out of his breaks better. You got to feel him coming out of his breaks more for him to get to the next level. And I think he will. But we've got a long term view on Henry Ruggs. Arnett was the other first rounder. In training camp prior to injury, he was playing really well. We were excited about Damon Arnett. He's instinctive, tough, and fast. But concussions, a broken hand, COVID, okay, you know. He's got to take care of business in the off season, he, nutrition, strength coach, consistency of a day to day program. John Abram, another first round pick. John gets out of control sometimes. John's got to play under control, accentuate the positive, and take away the negative. So there's some guys back there that we think can play, and there's some reasons their their growth has been stunted. But they need to step up this year. Yeah, and, and speaking of Henry, and Corey Littleton kind of falls in the same category, Mike, where at the end of the season, they were both very honest in their assessments of what they did in 2020 on the field. Corey was probably, to be honest, was the most blunt I've ever heard an NFL player in his assessment of what he did. And as a general manager, is does that kind of give you some – some excitement in the, in the fact that they're both being so accountable to what they need to do for not only themselves and their position group, but for this team to take a step forward in 2021? I think the whole team needs to be accountable and self-aware. And that starts with me and I got to do a better job. And, you know, we drafted some guys last year that were position changes and maybe that wasn't fair in a COVID year. You know, we didn't have an off season. We're asking kids to move from, from an outside corner into nickel in the case of a meek. Uh, we drafted a guy in the third round that, that we was a quarterback slot that we wanted to become a, a running back. Um, we drafted a safety that we were going to move to linebacker, Tanner Muse. He got hurt. You know, so uh, I kind of look back and, and say that's probably on me. Are we asking too much of these kids from a productivity perspective in year one in a COVID year when they're changing positions? So I think the entire building has got to be accountable. That's me the personnel side, the coaching side, and the players. And until organizationally we bring all that together, you know, 8-8 eight eight is not acceptable.
Mike Bayex are good enough to give us a few minutes down in Mobile, Alabama. And Mike, when we, when we tweeted out that we were going to have you on today, the biggest question, the question that we got the most often, and it kind of made me laugh, is so many people want to know, ask Mike, are we going to be aggressive in free agency? So I a two-parter for you. One, what does aggressive in free agency mean? Because it feels like every team is going to be aggressive in the guys they, wa- they want to get. And so I'll just also the second part of it, it just relay from the fans. What's the free agency plan? Is it to be aggressive in free agency? I, th- I think the better question is, are we going to be smart in free agency? Um, and and you can look at our track record and say we've made some bad decisions, potentially. Uh, we've also made some pretty good ones. Um, the reality this year is that we don't even know what the budget's going to be yet. No NFL team does. And so the fans understand you know, the salary cap was in that 195 to $200 million range a year ago. In a typical year, we'd go to about 220 to 225 this year. Because of the loss in revenue last year without any stadiums with fans, the floor for the salary cap was negotiated a year ago with the Players Association and the league. The salary cap could be 175 this year instead of what we thought would be two and a quarter. So every team in the league is sitting back and going, the floor is 175. It's not going to be two and a quarter. Is it going to be 175? Is it going to be 190? We don't even know yet. It's a moving target, okay? So I think free agency is going to start out a little bit more slowly for the entire league. Uh, We don't have a budget. We don't know what we can or can't spend yet. We've got to look at worst-case scenario, which is what if the cap is 175? So – I hate to go into this long conversation. I'd like to be aggressive and smart in free agency. Okay. Uh, You've got to evaluate your own players, which guys can you try and bring back? You've got to evaluate other people's players, but when it comes down to available cash and cap, that's a whole different conversation than in a typical year. Yeah. And and you, like you said, this is a, year that is not typical in so many ways. So just wrapping it up with Mike Mayock, Mike, what did you like about Gus Bradley when you met with him with coach Gruden? Uh, I've known Gus for 18 or 20 years. And, and to be clear, I was not in that interview. Sure. My father had passed and I wasn't there. Um, but I've known Gus for 18 to 20 years. Okay. And what I know about Gus is he's, he's got a consistent philosophy about defense. His defense plays, all of his defenses have played fast and hard. Um, I think he'll be 100% accountable to his players. And I think the players will buy into what he's teaching. And I, and I think all of those things are important, especially given how young we are on defense. Very well said. Well, hey, Mike, we appreciate your time. Stay safe, stay healthy and mobile, and uh, and hopefully we see you in the building sometime soon. I can't wait, Eddie. Thanks, man.